Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. And uh, so this is the, the last lecture of the semester for uh, History of Christianity. So it's been a really good semester. You guys have done a really good job in your discussion boards. Um, you've done a good job on your exams. So um, all of you are to be commended for all the hard work um, that you've put into this class this semester. So we've saved um, probably one of the most impactful movements in Christianity for uh, the last one to discuss, and that is <clears throat> global Pentecostalism. And so um, not only is it sort of naturally the, the last thing to discuss because it's a modern movement, um, but um, I think it's also appropriate to discuss it because it is um, far and away one of the most impactful uh, movements in all of Christianity. Um, and so when you think about uh, the modern Pentecostal movement, and so maybe we should define that right before we get too far. Um, for this lecture, when I say Pentecostalism, I am referring to most of the time I'm referring to what we would call classical Pentecostalism. Those are the, the churches, the denominations, the, the, the groupings of churches that trace their roots back to some of the first Pentecostal revivals in North America in the late 19th and early 20th century. Now, as a matter of sort of grouping various Christians together, we oftentimes will also talk about um, charismatic. So you oftentimes see Pentecostal and charismatic together. So I'm going to give you some statistics in just a minute. And we'll give you a really big number. That number encompasses both Pentecostals and charismatics. But most of this lecture is going to be concerned with uh, the history of classical Pentecostalism. Um, but we'll talk about some challenges. Um, I'll, I'll lay out the, the goals for the lecture in just a minute. But so, so Pentecostalism are those movements, uh, churches, um, groupings of churches, you know, groupings of independent churches, independent churches that can trace the genesis of their particular church group to the early Pentecostal revivals, holiness Pentecostal revivals of the late 19th and early, early 20th century. Charismatics, now that term has morphed, I would say, over the last uh, few decades. But typically when you talk about charismatics, originally what that term referred to were those mainline churches like the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church. In fact, the Episcopal Church was the first charismatic church. Um, and essentially what that means is that means that these are mainline churches that began to experience the various spiritual gifts, namely uh, speaking in tongues. The reason if you haven't already figured it out, the reason that we use the term Pentecostal is because it is referring to that event in Acts chapter 2 where Jesus has ascended. Before he ascends, he, he gives the disciples some instructions. He says, okay, first of all, go. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, right? And the second thing he said is, I want you to go wait in Jerusalem for the promise of my father. Now, prior to Jesus's uh, passion, his crucifixion and his, his, uh, his resurrection, especially in John, we, we read in the farewell passages in John that Jesus 
referred to this promise of the Father as the paraclete. We, um, if you took me last semester for for um, for pneumatology, we talk about uh, the paraclete, but it's uh, it's a compound Greek word from para, which means beside. Kaleo means I call. That's um, uh, first person singular, present active indicative. I call. And so um, paraclete would be one called along beside. So Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. So when he's getting ready to ascend, he says, hey, go go make disciples. Um, but before you do, go wait in Jerusalem for the promise. And he's referring to the paraclete. So when you read when you read the account of that in in Luke's second book, which is Acts, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts. In the second chapter of Acts, we see that when the disciples, the 120 of them, were gathered together in Jerusalem, that they heard the sound of a rushing wind. They saw uh, flames of fire that looked like tongues dancing above the heads of everyone there. And then the 120 people in the upper room, the, the followers of Jesus, began speaking in other languages. Now, the people down below who were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost heard this. They heard their own language, and then Peter preaches the first sermon of the Christian church. And so because that event happened during the Feast of Pentecost, penta means 50, so this was 50 days after Passover, Jesus was crucified at Passover, so this would have been roughly 50 days after uh, Jesus was crucified. And so because that event in the New Testament happened uh, for the first time in, uh, on the day of Pentecost or during the Feast of Pentecost, beginning in, uh, we're going to talk about a timeline in just a minute, but beginning in the late 19th century, on a, into today, churches that speak in tongues and that uh, believe and practice the charismatic gifts, the spiritual gifts, uh, charisma means grace, so the, the gifts of grace from the Spirit um, are typically referred to as Pentecostal because it's a throwback to the day of Pentecost. Charismatic, from the word Charis, grace, right? The gifts of grace, the spiritual gifts of grace. Charismatic typically refers to those groupings of churches that um, that believe in the full gospel. That's another term that's used uh, for believing in the gifts of the Spirit. Um, are those churches that are mainline or that cannot trace their roots back to those early Pentecostal revivals that we will be talking about in just a minute. So that's why you can lump the two together. So the term Pentecostal or classical Pentecostal or the term charismatic can mean essentially the same thing. There are some distinctives between the two groups. We're not going to really get into that here because this is more about history than it is theology. But that's why you can refer to those two together, Pentecostal charismatic. So, so the modern Pentecostal movement, which began at the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, is now the largest segment of global Protestantism on the planet. It's also the segment of Christianity responsible for most of the growth. So... Uh, in Europe and in North America, Christianity is declining, but it's growing in Latin America, Central America, uh, South America, Africa, and Asia. And the, the form of Christianity that's really growing is Pentecostalism. So today, nearly 30%, I think the number according to Pew Research Group is right around 27%. So one in three, basically one in three Christians on the planet identify as Pentecostal or charismatic. So here's why I say 
that the modern Pentecostal movement is one of the most notable historic events in Christianity. So prior to 1896, there were effectively zero Pentecostals. Now, there may have been groups that were speaking in tongues and operating the gifts of the Spirit somewhere in the world that we just don't know about. So effectively, that's why I say effectively, in 1896, there were zero Pentecostals on the planet. By the end of the 20th century, 100 years later, there were over 600 million Pentecostals, and that includes both Pentecostals and Charismatics. 644 million, I think, is the exact number, but I just said over 600 million. So this makes the modern Pentecostal movement one of, if not the most, aggressive revival movements in the history of Christianity. That's all within the last 100 years. So that's why it's so important to really understand this, whether you whether your church is a Pentecostal church or not. It's very important, I think, that if you are going to take a class in the history of Christianity that you discuss this. I, I teach a course in, uh, in world religions for a college um, locally. And when I talk about Christianity, I talk about some of the stuff we're going to talk about tonight because it's such a such an integral part of global Christianity. So um, so here are our goals uh, for this lecture tonight. So the first goal is we're going to discuss the history of the movement. We're going to walk through several revival events, and each of those revival events has a name. Like the first one we're going to talk about is the Shearer Schoolhouse Revival. So Pentecostalism was really formed in the holiness, the Wesleyan holiness revivals of the, the 19th century. So we're going to talk about some of those revival movements that really formed uh, modern Pentecostalism. And then we're going to discuss the impact of the movement. What impact is Pentecostalism making on the modern church today? And then we're going to talk about some of the challenges that Pentecostals face, they have faced, and what they continue to face moving forward. So um, so that's kind of where we're going. That's what we're doing um, for this lecture. If you have um, comments or you have questions, uh, just type them into the chat, and uh, I'll do my best to answer your questions. So the first... <clears throat> The first notable revival that we have related to the Pentecostal movement happened in 1896 uh, in a little place called Camp Creek, North Carolina, um, at the Shearer Schoolhouse. So we'll back up 10 years. In 1886, a group of Methodist, Presbyterians, and Baptists in this area in western North Carolina were not happy with the state of Christianity and churches and creedalism and and just some, they just had some problems with what they saw and they wanted to uh, form a church that they believed was more concerned with to the best of their ability, mimicking the Christianity of the New Testament. So in 1886, this group got together. These people all left their church and they formed their own, essentially their own denomination called the Christian Union. It was headed by um, the Spurlings, uh, Richard Spurling, R.G. Spurling and his son, Richard Spurling. And so um, the Christian Union met and uh, was holding revivals, growing, uh, adding congregations throughout western North Carolina and eastern Tennessee. And in 1896, the Christian Union held a revival in Camp Creek, North Carolina. Now, you can go, if you want to, um, to Camp Creek, and you can see uh, all of that area. There's um, one of the denominations we're going to mention in just a minute. They oversee a huge piece of land. It's called Field, either Field Singular or Fields, plural, Fields of the Woods. It's kind of hard to say. 
but um, has a ton of historical information about um, the Christian Union and uh, this Shearer Schoolhouse revival. But in 1896, um, there were um, they were having a revival meeting at the Shearer Schoolhouse, and the revival was led by three lay preachers, uh, two Methodist and a Baptist lay preacher. And so during this revival, people began to come forward and pray and pray for uh, holiness in life and more of God and to experience all that God had for them. And that group testified that about 100 people in that revival began speaking in an unknown language, began to speak in tongues in 1896. Now, what this Shearer Schoolhouse Revival is then, it, it is... It is the very first recorded instance of speaking in tongues. Now, the, the technical name, the theological name, for, the word for uh, speaking in tongues is glossolalia. I don't use that a ton. Um, I, I typically will say speaking in tongues. People understand what that means. Even if they don't understand what it is, they understand what it means. So I typically say speaking in tongues. But this is the first recorded instance since possibly the fifth century when we saw uh, the decline and eventual end of Montanism, which lasted from the second to the fifth century. So this was a, a huge moment in the history of Christianity, 1896. So there are, there are two current Pentecostal denominations that trace their roots back to the Shearer Schoolhouse Revival. Um, uh, the first is the Church of God, located in Cleveland, Tennessee, headquarters in Cleveland, Tennessee, and the Church of God of Prophecy. I think the Church of God of Prophecy is also, it is headquartered in Cleveland, Tennessee as well. Um, um, the Church of God has Lee University and Pentecostal Theological Seminary. So the Church of God is the oldest surviving Pentecostal denomination in the world. So during this Shearer schoolhouse revival, you have these people that were experiencing speaking in tongues. And of course, you know, a small rural community in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, uh, these, these neighbors in these areas uh, weren't too fond of what was going on. So so there were a couple of different responses from the community or, you know, four or five different responses from the community about this new phenomenon. First of all, Baptist churches, which just like today, Baptist churches sort of um, dominate the landscape of rural America. You um, be very difficult to go to almost any town in the Southeast United States and, there not be a first Baptist church, at least, and then other Baptist churches. So the Baptist churches in the area began excommunicating members that testified of speaking in tongues, because even though it was a Christian union revival, um, people that were not a part of the Christian union was were attending the revival. It was a community event, so people would go. Um, the other response from the community, and I always thought this was very interesting to me. Um, so the Christian Union began building, congregate, began to grow. People began, um, a lot of the people that, that were turned out of these Baptist churches started going to these Christian Union churches, and the denomination, the Christian Union denomination started to grow. And so they began building churches. So men from local communities would disassemble the churches that the Christian Union built, and then they would burn the lumber. So they wouldn't set fire to a church. They were morally opposed to setting fire to the church, but they were A-OK -okay with disassembling the building and then burning the individual components. I find that fascinating. Um, I guess I'm just too lazy to be legalistic. If that's the case, I would have probably been the guy that was like, Hey, isn't it the same if we just set fire to it and not tear it down? Can we not tear it down? Or can I come back when you've got it torn down? Um, so, but they began burning uh, the churches essentially. Um, 
it did get violent for many families. Um, men were dragged from their home. People were dragged from their home. They were whipped with whips and belts. Um, people would, would uh, ride horses um, by these houses and would fire guns into the houses of people that um, were part of this Pentecostal revival. Um, wells were salted. I don't know if you know what that means, but um, if you have a well and someone dumps a bunch of salt in your well, now you have a salt water well and you can't drink the water. You have to dig a new well. Now we kind of take that for granted a little bit because we have, um, we have large machinery that dig wells, but uh, these wells were all dug by hand. And I don't know if you've ever tried to dig a hole in the ground in Western North Carolina, but you don't get too far before you get into clay and rocks. It's very difficult. So, so they were sabotaging their wells or salting. Um, they're not assaulting, but salting, S-A-L-T-I-N-G, salting uh, the wells. Uh, and then the children paid a price because children were bullied at school. school. They were beat up at school. And so uh, many of the Christian Union members um, had to pull their kids out of school because of the bullies. So in 1907, Christian Union changed its name to Church of God. Uh, that name comes directly from the King James Version of the New Testament. That's that's a phrase that Paul used quite a bit, to the Church of God at whatever. And so um, the Christian Union changed their name to Church of God. Uh, that denomination still uses uh, the name Church of God, um, and it is the old, world's oldest surviving Pentecostal denomination. So it all started in the United States in Camp Creek, North Carolina, in 1896. But there were other pockets in Camp Creek and Shear Schoolhouse was not in any way even the most substantial revival um, in the United States or, or in the world uh, for the early days of Pentecostalism. We talk about it because it's the first um, and it's, it still survives today. So that's a sheer schoolhouse revival. Another revival that we want to talk about, and someone that, that we probably should have spent way more time uh, talking about Charles Parham, but the other event that is notable in the history of Pentecostalism is the 1901 Topeka outpouring. Now, there was a man who was a Methodist minister. His name was Charles Parham. Uh, Charles Parham uh, left the Methodist Church and um, started a school, a Bible school, in Topeka, Kansas, called the Bethel uh, Bible School. Opened its doors, had 30 or 40 uh, students at this, this small Bible school in Topeka, Kansas. So Parham had to, he was a very popular holiness preacher, Methodist holiness preacher, and so he was leaving to go preach a series of, of revival or of a revival. And so he was the main teacher for the students. And so he said, okay, while I'm gone, I have a, a project for the class, for the all the students. Um, I want, when I come back, I want you guys to present biblical evidence for what the New Testament referred to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you have to remember, as far as these folks in Topeka, Kansas were concerned, no one had spoken in tongues in centuries. They did not know about Shearer Schoolhouse. They did not know about Christian Union, did not know um, what was happening with um, Richard and R.G. Sperling um, over in western North Carolina and eastern Tennessee. So as far as they were concerned, they were searching the Bible to see what was the evidence for that? And so when he came back, um, his 30 students presented their information and Parham encouraged his students to begin praying around the clock. And so that's what these 30 or 40 students did. They began praying in shifts um, for more of God and for uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So on January 1st, 1901, the students were engaged in prayer, and one student 
a female student, Agnes Osman, asked that her fellow students would lay hands on her and pray that she would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Agnes and other students in Topeka testified that while the students were praying, while the students had their hands on Agnes, that she began to speak in other tongues. Over the next two or three days, by January 3rd, um, most of the students began to testify that they had spoken in tongues as well. Now, this revival was very short-lived because just a few months later, uh, Parham closed the school and all of these students, Agnes Osmond and all these other students, essentially dispersed to their native communities, states, and carried this message with them to those states, right? But Parham, sticking to his idea of establishing a Bible school to train pastors in the holiness tradition, reopened uh, his school in 1905 in Houston, Texas, where he began taking in students. And one of his students was the son of former slaves, William Seymour, who is perhaps the single most important person when it comes to discussing the modern Pentecostal movement. So you had Shearer Schoolhouse sort of over on an island by itself. And then you had Charles Parham and this group of students in Topeka, Kansas. You had this Topeka outpouring. One of the students from Houston that Parham had a huge impact on was William Seymour. We'll talk about William Seymour in just a minute. So Shearer Schoolhouse, the Topeka outpouring. And the third event that we'll discuss is Azusa Street, the Azusa Street Revival. So let's talk about Azusa Street. You may already know, you already may have some affiliation with just the word Azusa. There's a, um, a Pentecostal school in California called Azusa Pacific University. I think it's in California. Pretty sure it's in Los Angeles. So in 1905, the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Los Angeles um, needed a sabbatical. And so he went to Israel and spent some time on his sabbatical. When he came back, when he was getting ready to come back to the States, he stopped in Wales. Now, if you remember from some of your reading earlier this semester, you probably read about the Welsh Revival. So the Welsh Revival was in its sort of final days when the pastor, whose name was Joseph Smale, S-M-A-L-E, Joseph Smale, when uh, Reverend Smale came back through Wales, he was able to be exposed to and even participate in um, some of the churches that were, that were still experiencing revival as part of the Welsh revival. So when Smale returns to Los Angeles, he immediately begins preaching from Acts chapter 2. Now, we've already stated in the introduction to this lecture the importance of Acts chapter 2 in terms of the Pentecostal movement. It is Acts chapter 2 where we read the story of uh, the Holy Spirit coming onto the disciples and them speaking in tongues. So Smale starts preaching from Acts chapter 2, and a revival breaks out in the Los Angeles First Baptist Church that lasted for 15 weeks. And there were several things that characterized this revival in the First Baptist Church. So first of all, the first thing that, that defined it, like it, when the paper was writing about it and when people in the community were, were talking about the revival, one of the things that was one of the distinctives of this revival was that large groups of people were repenting loudly during the services. So, so this idea of the mourner's bench or what we call maybe the altar developed during the holiness revivals where people would come to the front and kneel down at this wooden structure and they would pray and then they would have people lay hands on them and pray. And so one of the defining characteristics of this revival was that people were just running to the front of the church and just falling at the altar and just praying for mercy and praying for more of God and praying for, for healing and praying for salvation. So that was, that was one of, of the distinctions. It was very loud. It was, it makes me think of, 
of you know what David said. I forget the name of the, the number of the psalm, but it said David was dancing naked. And they didn't like that. And David's response was, I'll become even more undignified than this. Um, some of you guys that, that lead worship for a living probably know what psalm it is. But it kind of makes me think of that, where there was this just this, it was characterized by a lack of personal dignity, crying, wailing, screaming, concert prayer. If you don't know what concert prayer is, it's when everybody's praying at once and they're not praying the same thing. It's not reciting something. You've got a whole room full of people praying. It's loud. It was cacophonous, not very dignified. And the second defining feature of this 15-week revival at the First Baptist Church in Los Angeles was blacks and whites were worshiping together in prominent displays of racial reconciliation. The interesting thing about that, let's pay attention to the timeline. We're in 1905. People were attending this revival that no doubt had fought in the war between the states, probably on both sides, both the Confederacy and the Union. And so churches were not integrated anywhere in the United States. It wasn't just a Jim Crow thing. It wasn't just a Southern thing. It was across the United States, churches were not integrated. But at the First Baptist Church in Los Angeles, part of this revival, you began to see blacks and whites worshiping together in prominent displays of reconciliation. When I say prominent displays, holding hands, hugging, uh, standing side by side, kneeling side by side, we don't think anything about that for the most part. I go to an integrated church. There are a lot of African Americans, a lot of Hispanics, a lot of Asians that I go to church with. I don't it doesn't even occur to me that they're somehow a different race than me. It just doesn't occur to me because it just is what it is. But you have to remember that in this time in American history, blacks and whites in the same building, worshiping together, holding hands nonetheless, hugging nonetheless, kneeling down in prayer, laying hands on each other to pray for each other, white men laying hands on black women, black women laying hands on white men, White women laying hands on black men, black men laying hands on white women, just as fully integrated service. Um, uh, it was one of the one of the hallmarks of the revival. So as the revival began to grow, the the leaders the in the First Baptist Church came to Pastor Smale and said, either put a stop to some of these undignified displays or leave the church. And so Smale decided that it wasn't up to him to intervene in a work of God, and they they fired him. Even after he was fired, and even after he left Los Angeles, that revival fervor still burned. These people were not meeting at the First Baptist Church, but they were meeting in homes, in home groups and prayer groups in the home where they were praying for each other and um, praying for healing. And so there was a really small holiness church um, in Los Angeles that several of its members, a very small congregation, but several of its members had been a part of the First Baptist revival. And after the revival closed down, this church found themselves in need of a pastor. They had a connection to Charles Parham. They it was a it was a African American congregation. They knew Charles about Charles Parham. Um, they were connected to William Seymour, one of Parham's students, and they asked William Seymour to come and pastor them to serve as their pastor. So as soon as Seymour arrived at this mission, the small mission, he began preaching about a new Pentecost. Now, remember, in the whole timeline of things, um, Seymour was not part of the 1901 Topeka outpouring, but he was one of Parham's students, and he no doubt would have known about it and 
he would have sat under Parham's teachings. Excuse me, my nose is itching again. He would have known about Parham's teachings regarding the baptism in the Spirit. So um, Seymour gets to uh, Los Angeles and immediately begins preaching of a new Pentecost experience, and people began flocking to his services. What, what Seymour brought to this small black mission was the same revival fervor that Smail had brought to the First Baptist Church. Well, now First Baptist was closed down, and this revival was, was existing in people's homes, right? But not in the church on Sunday morning. Seymour arrives, and he shows up with this same revival fervor, this same um, emphasis on the Holy Spirit, this same emphasis on personal holiness. And so people begin, whites and blacks begin flocking to this mission. Well, they outgrew their present location, and they found a dirt floor warehouse on Azusa Street in Los Angeles, and began conducting regular revival services. So the services began uh, um, growing from just on Sundays that they started meeting every night during the week and began holding revival services in uh, late 1905, early 1906. So Seymour had never experienced speaking in tongues, but he believed it to be true biblically he was connected to Charles Parham, whose students experienced it in Topeka. And so Parham was preaching the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that the same, the same experience of the Spirit that was available to the New Testament believers to give them power to witness was available to Christians today. That was the message of the new Pentecost. Well, on April 9th, 1906, a man named Edward Lee, who had been participating in the revival, had been fasting for 10 days and praying for God to give him this new Pentecost experience. And he was attending a Bible study in the home of Richard and Ruth Asbury. Not Asbury, like Asbury Seminary, which is spelled A-S-B-U-R-Y. This is A-S-B-E-R-R-Y. So, Richard and Ruth Asbury. And he asked to be prayed for in this Bible study. And while they had their hands on uh, Edward Lee, he began to speak in tongues. Now, obviously, everyone that was attending the Azusa Street Revival heard about it. Um, Seymour started telling people about it. And hundreds of people began to experience speaking in tongues. And the Azusa Street Revival lasted from 1906 to 1915, and nearly every major Pentecostal denomination today can trace its roots back to the Azusa Street Revival, except for those groups of denominations. People from all over the world were coming. Um, there, was a, there was a person that attended the revival that, that published a newspaper, and so... So sort of weekly, they were chronicling the things that were happening at Azusa Street. People from around the world were coming into Los Angeles to see what was happening and then going back to their homes in other parts of the world and preaching this new Pentecost. Something very interesting to think about, um, and I'll never forget this, and I don't know if this is true or not, I think it is. It's, a, it's certainly a good theory. But when Paul wrote the book of Romans, Paul had never been to Rome. He did not establish the church in Rome. In fact, none of the original disciples established the church in Rome. One of the leading theories about the establishment of the church at Rome is that there were Jewish people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And they stayed because, you know, it says there were 3,000 people that, that believed and were baptized on the day of Pentecost. And so a leading theory is that some of those people went back to Rome and started 
churches in the capital of Rome. So this is how the, the Pentecostal movement really spread. You had all of these people worldwide that were coming into Los Angeles, which is an international city. You had all these people that were coming up through Mexico that were you know, coming from Asia by boat or coming from uh, Eastern Europe by boat uh, over the Pacific uh, or railway, uh, you know, landing in New York or or uh, Savannah or somewhere like that and, and, and traveling by railroad uh, all the way to California to attend this revival. And then they would go home. They would start churches preaching the new Pentecost. And so that is really how the Pentecostal movement really began to spread so quickly. Now, the Azusa Street Revival had several distinguishing features, just like um, the 15-week revival at First Baptist had several distinguishing features. The Azusa Street Revival had many distinguishing features. So first of all, it was led by an African-American, William Seymour, who eventually experienced speaking in tongues, um, had never experienced it before, but believed it. And the fact that William Seymour was a son of slaves, he was a first generation free black man that, that God would choose to, to send this revival through the preaching of a, an African-American was unheard of. African-Americans weren't leading revivals in the nation because the nation was still a fairly racist place. Even though the Civil War was over, um, it, it was not easy to be black. And I don't, I don't know if that surprises you or not. It shouldn't. But the fact that it was led by an African-American is a pretty significant event in itself. Just like, um, just like First Baptist, it was fully integrated, but not just blacks and whites. Um, by this time, uh, because it lasted from 06 to 15, um, you had blacks, whites, and Hispanics from Mexico all worshiping together. The other thing that's interesting about Azusa Street is that women had a very visible leadership role in the revival. Women were leaders in the movement, in the revival. Uh, another feature, thousands of revival participants testified to speaking in tongues. That's sort of the, that's sort of the, the big, the, the big distinctive, right? That people were speaking in tongues, but not just speaking in tongues, but hundreds of people were testifying to physical healing, uh, deliverance from alcoholism, um, marriages being reconciled. Um, so that was a, that was a defining feature. And then I've already mentioned it a little bit, but it created significant missionary fervor. Hundreds, hundreds of missionary efforts were launched as a result and from Azusa Street. So if you attend a Pentecostal church today, then, then your church can trace its roots back to the Azusa Street Revival, unless you attend most likely the Church of God or Church of God of Prophecy or any group that maybe have splintered off of those two denominations over the years. Um, it's, it's likely that, that your church, um, comes through Azusa street. All right. So that is the history up to the beginning of modern Pentecostalism. So let's talk about the impact of, of the Pentecostal movement. I would argue that perhaps the most visible impact of the movement is its rapid growth and its domination of Protestantism. It continues to be the predominant expression of Protestant Christianity in Central South America, Africa, and Asia. The other impact that Pentecostalism has had is on mainline Protestant churches through the rise of the charismatic movement. Charismatic movement is a very, very big movement. A lot of people confuse charismatic and Pentecostal, even though sort of, you know, categorize them sort of together. But there's enough theological distinctions where you really shouldn't. Um, but but the Pentecostalism's uh, 
impact on these mainline churches that launched the charismatic movement can't be understated. The other thing, which some people don't think about, so when you go back, go back in time, go back over a hundred years, go back to the end of the 18th century, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, churches were very sort of high church, right? You had very formal singing, you had responsive readings, you know, you, it is very formal. Um, event where a lot of what was done was done by the professional clergy or people trained in the church. You know, if you had, if you had a woman that sang opera, for instance, in the city, it would be unusual for her to be the main attraction at the church because she would sing at the church. But one of Pentecostalism's, one of the biggest impacts on Protestantism is this very expressive worship, praying out loud, raising hands, lively music, music with, with tambourines and guitars and, and other sort of, sort of non-organs, right? Non-organ music. So this type of worship has permeated non-Pentecostal Protestant, Protestant churches and is really responsible for much of what we see in in the modern Protestant church. It's very interesting. Um, I, I came up through the Church of God. That's how I know so much about Shearer Schoolhouse. I had to take a class at Lee University in Church of God history. So, so I trace my roots, my Pentecostal roots, back to um, Shearer Schoolhouse and not Azusa Street. But when I was younger... Baptist churches, which predominated, which dominated the, the landscape in South Georgia, were still very formal, right? They um, they would have choirs, but um, not a lot of congregational singing. You know, uh, down the road in the little Pentecostal church where I live, people were standing on their feet and singing and raising their hands and crying and speaking in tongues, and it was, it was very, it, it was it was very lively. And it was, you know, everyone had a role. And so if you fast forward several years, I found myself um, helping to plant a Southern Baptist church. That's another story for another day in the town I lived in, in Dallas, Georgia. It was, it had already started and I joined uh, the church when it was maybe three months old. So really it had already been planted and already started. By the time I got there, but I was a part of the formation of that church for, for 10 years before I moved to Florida. And I was so surprised when I started attending the church because I could not tell much of a difference between the type of worship I was experiencing at this Southern Baptist church and the type of worship I experienced growing up in a Pentecostal church. There were some elements that were absent. Obviously, they weren't speaking in tongues and uh, people weren't, you know, um, crying out and things like that, but it, raising hands and tears and, and you know, just very expressive. And so you can thank the Pentecostal movement for, for, for these non-Pentecostal denominations adopting this congregational, really expressive uh, type of worship. The Pentecostal movement has also popularized laying on of hands and using oil to anoint the sick. Now, that's something that has existed in Christianity since the beginning. But in American Protestantism, it had sort of fallen by the wayside a little bit. Um, but you can go to almost any Baptist or Methodist or Nazarene or any, any non-Pentecostal uh, denominational, Protestant denominational church in the United States, and at some point they will bring out the oil and they will anoint someone and pray for them. And so you can thank the Pentecostal movement for some of, for bringing some of that back. The other thing that you can really thank the Pentecostal church for is in the beginning days of Pentecostalism, they were for the most part uh, heavily persecuted by other Protestants. But you fast forward to today and you don't see that anymore. 
In fact, what you see now more than anything else, even in the seminaries for the non-Pentecostal seminaries, you see an acceptance of the charismatic gifts and sort of the, there are several approaches to it, but a very popular approach is, well, I believe in it. I'm not sure that Pentecostals are doing it correctly. I don't know, but I certainly believe in it because it's in the Bible. And so you see more of an acceptance of the, the charismatic gifts. And so what you don't see in these non-Pentecostal churches is you don't see um, they shy away from the public exercise of tongues or prophetic utterances or other physical manifestations, but they don't condemn or persecute like they did, you know, even 50, 50 or 60 years ago. So, so those are some of the, I think, the impacts on modern Protestantism that you see from uh, the Pentecostal movement. So uh, let's look at um, some of the challenges of the Pentecostal movement, and they are significant. And so let's address multiple challenges that I think Pentecostals are going to have to deal with in the coming decades. I didn't read this in a book. This is just my opinion, having grown up in a Pentecostal church and um, really sort of staking my claim uh, as a professor and in academics as a Pentecostal theologian. That's really kind of my thing um, that, that I'm working on becoming an expert in and been studying it for you know a couple of decades now. In my opinion, the biggest challenge that the Pentecostal and I'm now now what I am going to do is I'm going to lump together Pentecostals and Charismatics in in this portion of of the lecture. But the Pentecostal movement really needs to figure out a way to address these larger than life personalities that claim spiritual authority with no accountability. Because this is breeding scandal after scandal after scandal. I remember the first big scandal um, that we saw in the 20th century. Not the first, but certainly one of the biggest scandals was uh, PTO. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were scamming people, um, taking money from people for these um, timeshare condominiums. They just... Uh, living these lavish lifestyles and begging for money on TV and claiming spiritual authority over this matter and that matter. And, and God's showing me that, that if you'll just give your money, that he'll bless you. It's sort of the, really the beginning, the middle of the beginning of this prosperity movement. But what you had was you had these people who were making claims and who had no real accountability to anyone and they were larger than life, and they were perceived as spiritual authorities. And um, and so eventually they it was found out Jim Baker actually went to jail uh, for embezzlement. It was a big scandal. Um, another huge scandal in the Pentecostal church was Jimmy Swaggart. Many of you may not even know who Jimmy Swaggart is, but if you if you know who the, the rock and roll legend uh, Jerry Lee Lewis is, uh, Jimmy Swaggart is Jerry Lee Lewis's cousin. And where... Uh, Jerry Lee pursued rock and roll. Jimmy Swaggart uh, pursued um, preaching and was one of the pr probably in the, you know, 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s. One of the most popular, one of those widely known preachers in the in the world had a television ministry that reached millions of people. He was Assembly of God, um, which is probably the largest Pentecostal denomination. I don't know if that's still true or not, but at one time, the Assembly of God was the largest Pentecostal denomination. But it turns out Jimmy Swagger was caught with prostitutes, not just once, but multiple times. And so what you had was you had this really larger-than-life figure that had no accountability, that had the world at his fingertips, that was seen as a spiritual authority, do whatever they want. Whatever they said was law. Um, they, they almost acted as if they were above accountability because they were super spiritual. Uh, another scandal um, was um, this prosperity preacher named Robert Tilton. Robert Tilton really popularized the, the prosperity movement in the, the 80s and 90s. And he was on TV, had this huge TV following, 
was asking for money to do mission work and you know he would pray while he was on the camera you can you can find some of his videos um on youtube and you find people that make fun of his videos on youtube for sure um but robert tilton would you know he would be praying he would say god showing me that there's a you know, this person or that person in this city or that city and God saying, be faithful and give this money, whatever. And so one of the one of the nightly news shows like 2020 or or um, uh, one of those sort of news magazine shows um, discovered that this guy lived in a mansion, had property in Florida, had a yacht, was living this opulent lifestyle all of this money that he was telling people to give to his ministry so that they could so that they could preach the gospel across the world was taking the money and living like a king. Um, there was a, another scandal was Earl Polk. Earl Polk, um, pastor in Atlanta, uh, began teaching that um, Christians were little gods with the authority of Christ uh, just unchecked. Nobody in his life, no accountability. Uh, this dominant, really dominant spiritual authority or perceived spiritual authority um, that, you know, would, you know when, when, when the man of God or woman of God says, God spoke to me, and people believe that. Whether God spoke or not, they believe it. And there's no accountability. And if you do question it, right, if, if you're one of those people that says, ah, I don't know if God said that, then you then find yourself potentially um, opposed to God, right? The words that these people use are considered the words of God. And that's what Earl Polk did. Turns out Earl Polk was accused of, of sexual misconduct, accused of molestation, and, and it, it, it ruined a lot of people. Um, probably you may not, and a lot of you may not know, but I remember when I was in college, I had to read a book by a man named Ted Haggard. It was a great book. Ted Haggard had a great story of, of taking the gospel to Colorado Springs, Colorado, which was, was a, one of the leading cities in the nation for the occult. And um, he and some other pastors began praying together and a revival broke out in Colorado and turned that city around, like really turned around. Ted Haggard was, he was a charismatic Pentecostal uh, preacher. He actually was the president of the National Association of Evangelicals. Ted Haggard was um, seen as an authority on church growth and spirituality and discipleship. And then um, it was discovered that Ted Haggard was having regular homosexual encounters with male prostitutes, which he confessed to and stepped down to, you know, receive counseling and, and things like that. But you had, this spiritual authority that was, that was, you know, proclaiming the Pentecostal message, proclaiming spiritual authority when in reality they were engaging in sinful activities unchecked because of their spiritual authority. And the last one um, we'll talk about is the, the, at the time, in the 90s and early 2000s, the largest Christian congregation in the world was in Seoul, was in, um, was in uh, North Korea, Seoul, North Korea. It was the, um, oh, I forget the name of the church now, but the, the pastor was, was David Young E. Cho. And David Young E. Cho would say some crazy things, but he had set himself up as this spiritual authority where he would say what he wanted, do what he wanted, um, he had his people donating money, and he turns out he was he was embezzling money and buying stocks that uh, for his son's company. Went to jail. Went to jail for three years over it. But the point of that is is one of the biggest challenges, in my opinion, to the Pentecostal movement is Pentecostals seem to like celebrities. They tend to like the man of God or the woman of God that speaks with authority and speaks with a spiritual authority and speaks very confidently about power over the kingdom of darkness. And Pentecostals love that. And they treat those people like they can do no wrong. And that is a real challenge uh, 
to Pentecostals moving forward. Now, you are seeing larger Pentecostal denominations, larger Pentecostal churches, particularly independent churches. It's typically in the independent churches where you see that. Or if there's a denominational church, like in Jimmy Swaggart's case, that he's so big that the denomination really has no control over him anyway. Because the denomination tried to, after it was discovered that Jimmy Swaggart was having sex with prostitutes, the, the denomination stepped in and tried to say, hey, here's some things you need to do to, um, to deal with this sin in your life. And, you know, he just didn't have to do it because he was Jimmy Swaggart. So you typically see it in the, the independent movements, but um, I think Pentecostals are going to have to get a hold of that. I think they're going to have to, if, if they claim to, to reflect the, the entire gospel in the entire Bible, that's one of the hallmarks of Pentecostalism, that, that they believe in the full gospel. If it's written in the Bible, we believe it. Well, accountability is written in the Bible. Having elders is written in the Bible. Not allowing a young person to become an elder because they could become conceited and, and suffer the same judgment as the devil is in the Bible. So anyway, so I think that's a challenge for homosexuals. Uh, some people argue uh, another challenge that Pentecostals must really deal with, and this was in one of your discussion questions, is there is a sharp decline in Pentecostal denominations among um, millennials, even, so I'm a Gen X, so among Gen X, I'm 50 years old, and even younger, you're seeing this sharp drop in the number of people that belong to a Pentecostal church, but don't experience speaking in tongues. In the beginning of the movement, in the late 19th and early 20th century, Shearer Schoolhouse, Topeka, and Azusa Street, almost everyone, right? It was it was the defining aspect. Well, now what we're dealing with is Pentecostal denominations are seeing a very sharp decline in this these exercising of the gifts, mainly in the United States. I think global Pentecostal uh, churches still retain that distinctive. Um, but one of the other challenges that Pentecostals face today is that the Pentecostal church, just like other churches in the United States, in the United States is on the decline. And so what a lot of denominations have is they have more members outside the United States than they do inside. I know the Church of God in Cleveland, Tennessee is this way. It literally has more members outside the United States than in. I think there's about 7 million members in the denomination, about a million in the United States, 6 million outside the United States. But the leadership is still American bishops, right? The Americans are still. And so I think that Pentecostals are going to have to figure out a way to deal with that because what's happening to Pentecostalism, it, it is, has been, uniquely American, right? Because it it formed in the revival movements in the United States and then spread throughout the world. But now what's happened is the fire, those revival fires are still burning across the world, but they're dying in the United States. And so rather than having this uniquely American distinctive Pentecostal churches are developing these other cultural distinctives, these Latin American distinctives, these Asian distinctives. And so the Pentecostal church is really going through sort of a demographic change that is affecting the theology. Um, and that's a, another lecture for another time. But that is a challenge for uh, Pentecostals. So here's what we've done tonight. We've chronicled the major revival, Shear Schoolhouse, Topeka, Kansas, Azusa Street, Right. We've, we've chronicled that. We've talked about um, uh, some of the distinctives. Uh, we've talked about some of the challenges. Um, we've talked about some of the ways that the Pentecostal church has influenced other churches. Um, and even in the midst of all the challenges, um, the Pentecostal movement continues to grow. And so um, it still maintains its missionary zeal. And so um, for the foreseeable future, 
the growth of Christianity as a world religion is is linked to the growth of Pentecostalism in a way that can't be it can't be denied. It can't be, you can't ignore it. You just can't because if it wasn't for Pentecostalism, Christianity wouldn't be growing at all for the most part, right? That's a generalization, but anyway, so that's it. That's our, um, that's our lecture on Pentecostalism. I wanted you guys to understand uh, the genesis of the movement. I wanted you to understand um, some of the main events and timelines. And so um, that concludes our lecture. Uh, tonight that concludes our that's the last lecture of the semester so thank you for uh, listening in um, please uh, text me or send me an email if you have any questions and uh, I'll see you guys soon